So I'm going to take, why are ACL reconstructions failing in 2020? We know that ACL reconstructions are commonly performed procedures, the successful procedures. And we can see this particular footballer that I've done about 18 years back with a technique that's not followed today. He played competitive football for eight years. And now 18 years thereafter, he comes for an osteochondral patella fracture. His ACL looks good, revascularized, and many of these patients do well. But with the increase in number of primary ACL reconstructions, we know that the subsequent need for revision ACL reconstructions is also going to increase. And there's a good systematic review of level one and two prospective studies with a minimum five-year follow-up that show that ACL graft rupture ranges from 1.8% to 10.4%, and that with, has a pooled percentage of about 5.8%. So 5.8% of our ACLs are likely to fail. We also know that this is a normal population. If you have a high-risk group and you've got athletes only, you might find that these 5.8% percentages might go right up to 15 or 20% too, as has been seen with adolescent females. Any successful revision of a failed ACL surgery cannot be achieved without understanding the specific etiology and mode of failure of that primary ACL. And so I think for all of us, the causes of ACL reconstruction failure are important to understand. And these are technical, biological, traumatic, failure to recognize secondary instabilities and patient factors. And the most common cause that we at least see are technical reasons. So the first surgery had some problem that went wrong. Something went wrong with that primary procedure and that's why it's failed. You could also get biologic failures. That means your graft hasn't healed. You could get repeat trauma. You could get situations where the patient has had knee instability, but you've taken care of just the ACL and you've left the meniscus or you've left the uh, uh, PLC alone, and that's gonna result in failure of your primary procedure, which is the ACL, or there could be patient factors. Now the multicentric ACL revision group, uh, study group, reported that the distribution of these causes, as deemed by the revising surgeon, was trauma 32%, technical factors 24%, biologic 7%, and a combination of all these factors 37%. But we must realize that there's a little bit of a bias in this, because as soon as it's your own patient, then often you feel that it's trauma or a combination of factors. Whereas as soon as it's someone else's patient that you're revising, you tend to feel that it's maybe technical factors. So I think when you're studying your primary ACL that's failed, try and determine what the cause of this primary failure is, and we'll see these causes in detail. The first is technical factors. And the most common technical factors are non-anatomic tunnel placement. This, in our series, we've seen an up to 65%. And it's not really changed. What we saw in 2010 as the most common cause for our revision ACLs is still the most common cause for revision ACLs in 2019 when we've seen our 10-year sort of uh, causes for revision ACL. Anterior femoral tunnel. So you can see this. If that tunnel here is anterior, your graft is going to be short, flexion is going to be restricted, and over time when flexion is achieved, that's going to be at the cost of graft failure. On the other hand, you could get a 12 o'clock tunnel, and that again is not gonna serve its purpose. There's gonna be no rotational stability for that knee. If your tibial tunnel is anterior, then you're gonna have graft impingement, and slowly that graft is gonna have attrition and it's gonna fail. If you've got a posterior tibial tunnel, then you're gonna have a vertical ACL like this. And with that vertical ACL, of course, you can't expect rotational stability, and you probably also won't have translational stability. So that's gonna fail. Now, most people feel, yeah, all of these are old x-rays. Uh, what's really happening now? Is it changing now? No. As more and more surgeons keep doing ACL reconstructions, there's gonna be a learning curve. And I think in that learning curve, the most important part is where does your femoral insertion sit and can you get that anatomically? So we see this today too, that a lot of our revisions are being done because of non-anatomic femoral Tunnels. 
And if you've got an anterior femoral tunnel with an anterior tibial tunnel, like in this patient, I think that's a double whammy that ACL is going to fail very, very soon. So for all of you who are beginners and who are just starting off, it's useful to try and determine where is the ACL femoral insertion. And if you'll note, this is where that prior tunnel has gone. That's the graft, a little bit of a protuberant ACL bone there from the BTB with the screw. That's not where your graft should be. That's much too anterior. Try and define the over-the-top position here at the back because that exactly is where the ACL should be. If it's an acute patient, you can actually see that footprint there and try and make sure that your ACL sockets are within the footprint, both on the femoral and on the tibial side. The next cause in technical is insufficient graft material. So if you're doing a patient's ACL and you find that that quadruple semi is insufficient, please think of adding a gracilis to it. There are many studies that show you that the mean load to failure is relative to the diameter. And as we increase our diameter from seven to nine, you will have a significant increase in your mean load to failure. More importantly, sometimes we feel, how much of a difference does it make when we make our 7mm to an 8mm or our 7mm to a 9mm? Well, it makes a significant difference. As you can see here, as soon as we move from a 7 to 9, the cross-sectional area is significantly more, almost 62% more, and the increase in strength also is about 35% more. So I think that you should at least, when you're using a hamstring tendon, have a graph that's at least 8 mm in your root standard patient. And if it's a larger patient, it should be a 9 or 9.5 or sometimes even a 10. Inadequate notch plasty. So sometimes you'll note that some patients have a congenitally narrow notch, a stenotic notch. And if you don't identify that and you don't do a notch plasty, your secondary impingement because of that narrow notch is likely to cause attrition on your graft and your graft is likely to fail. So identify the notch and do a notch plasty in the indicated scenarios. And of course, tensioning and graft fixation. If you haven't tensioned your graft well, you haven't fixed it well, this kind of a fixation is of course gonna be a day one sort of failure. The next is biological failure. So here you've done your surgery well, but your graft hasn't healed. And of course, we saw this very commonly uh, uh, 15 and 18 years back when the Lars ligament was popular. But we see this nowadays when we've started, so we've started using allografts since the last nine years now. And we do see the rare case of failed ligamentization with the allograft, uh, cadaveric allograft ligaments that we're using. This can also happen with autografts. So you need to be aware of this and look out for this as one of the causes for failure. Infection and arthrofibrosis is gonna be covered in subsequent lectures. So I'm not gonna to touch on that at all. The third cause is traumatic causes. And in these, you can have two types of patients. Those that fail early, that means before graft incorporation has actually taken place. That means before six or nine months, these are early traumatic failures. And of course, the late ones that can happen subsequently during sports. And in these early failures, there are two groups of patients that I think you need to be particularly careful about. One is patients who have a high BMI. We know that a high BMI affects neuromuscular control. Patients who have a high BMI tend to recover their strength much more. Uh, it's a much slower process than in normal patients. So you need to be a little slow with these patients of a high BMI. Don't get them to start running, jumping early before ensuring that they've got their strength and they've got their neuromuscular control. The second is the enthusiastic adolescent or young male athlete who's really feeling normal long before his graft is healed and who's trying to do uh, stuff that's way beyond the capabilities of that graft at four months and five months. I think you need to be particularly careful of these over-enthusiastic young males. So these two groups tend to land up with early failures. But we also see very commonly nowadays late failures. So like this fast bowler, he's undergone an ACL reconstruction, right knee. This is done about six years back. 
He's back to competitive cricket since the last four to five years. He tries to go for a catch in his follow through. His spikes get caught, his ankle twists, his knee goes into hyperflexion with a vulgar sort of force, and that snaps his ACL. So, six years down the line, he snapped his ACL, and this is a true traumatic failure of his uh, ACL. And when you And when you see this, and when you see this on arthroscopy, you'll note what it looks like. So this is a patient whose ACL has healed. So you'll note that that ACL is healed in there, and that's where it snaps. So you can see that there's good healing here, but that's a complete tear of that ACL. And so you may actually find true traumatic failures too, and these two tend to happen. And as for the Mars study, they happen in at least 39% of patients today uh, in, in this era. Another common cause of failure that we've seen in our series is failure by the primary surgeon not to recognize secondary instability. And there are multiple causes for that. It could be skeletal malalignment, it could be meniscal loss, it could be a varus or a valgus instability, or it could be an anterolateral rotatory instability that's not being recognized. So like this patient, he's undergone two ACLs. The first was probably a transtibial. The second was probably a transportal, and he's still got a significant pivot shift and now can voluntarily shift and do a pivot shift too. A patient like this, if you don't recognize the anterolateral instability there and don't think of an extraarticular procedure for him, like uh, maybe an LET or an ALL, then this is likely to fail for the third time too. Varus and valgus instabilities, make sure that you identify whether the patient had a PLC or a posteromedial corner complex tear along with that ACL. And if that was missed, that ACL, which has been reconstructed, is going to fail. Excessive stresses are going to be put onto that graft because of inadequate capsule ligaments and when that fails, again, if you don't identify this and don't take care of this, you would have your revision failing too. So identify other ligament instabilities. Skeletal malalignment too needs to be identified. We know that varus malalignment puts excessive stresses on your ACL. And so if you haven't identified varus malalignment and you do just an ACL reconstruction, it's highly likely that over time, there's going to be a slow failure of that ACL and he's gonna come back to you with instability, with a virus malalignment. And in these scenarios, it's gonna be not just your revision ACL, you must think of doing a proximal tibial osteotomy. And you may add a decrease of your slope at the same time, take care of that ACL insufficiency. Meniscus deficiency, again, in our series, we've seen that this is one of the major causes for recurrent instability. We need to recognize that the meniscus is a secondary stabilizer for the ACL. So normally, you don't have an ACL, your meniscus there is your secondary stabilizer. That's gonna be taking all that load and over time, you'll end up with either a root tear or a ramp lesion or a longitudinal tear peripherally. And we know from many studies that if you've got a tear of just the ACL, you're likely to have an anterior translation of about 10 mm. But as soon as you've got a very significant anterior translation or you've got a pivot shift, you have to suspect that it's not just the ACL. Your ACL is gone and probably one of the menisci, most likely the lateral meniscus is insufficient. And if you don't take care of that insufficient lateral meniscus, then I think that you're likely to land up with failure again. So take this patient that we've revised. This is a revision ACL. His MRI prior to his primary ACL showed the meniscus tear. But for whatever reason, that surgeon opted not to repair it. You can see that that's an unstable meniscus, and this patient's come to us nine months after surgery with a failed primary ACL. I think that if you don't take care of these secondary stabilizers like the menisci, it's going to be putting a lot of excessive, unnecessary stresses on your ACL, and that ACL is likely to fail. So identify meniscus tears, especially root and ramp lesions, and repair these too during the revision.
And if you have a patient who's undergone a total medial meniscectomy, when you're doing a revision, think of a meniscus transplant because if you don't have your, if you, your entire meniscus on the, that medial side is gone, then doing just that revision is not going to give them stability. It's going to have to be an ACL reconstruction with a transplant. And finally, excessive posterior tibial slope. We know that there are numerous biomechanical and cadaveric studies today that suggest that an increased posterior tibial slope results in increased forces on not only the native ACL, but also an ACL graft. So I'm not suggesting that if your patient has an increased tibial slope in the primary situation, think of doing an ACL slope correction with your ACL reconstruction. But if you get a patient whose ACL reconstruction has failed and you find that he has an increased tibial slope, please look for it, identify it, and do discuss with your patient that you probably require a slope correction because otherwise your revision ACL is also likely to fail. So like in this patient who had a virus with an, uh, decrease, with an increased tibial slope, we've had to go ahead and do a slope correction with a medial opening wedge osteotomy. And finally, the patient factors. So we know that oh, there's some high-risk patients, obesity, hyperlaxity mm -hmm. with genuvalgum, patients who have poor neuromuscular control, these are all causes for reconstruction failure. And there are numerous studies which show us now that the in, amongst the intrinsic factors, there are anatomic factors, and of this, I think BMI and hyperlaxity are the most important. So these are risk factors for non-contact injuries of the ACL. And I think in India, this is particularly important because we know that 73% of urban Indians are overweight. And if 73% of our urban Indians are overweight and almost half of them are obese, a lot of them are going to come in for ACL reconstructions. And if we don't take care of that obesity factor, at least don't counsel our patients or don't protect them, then we will have a significantly higher number of failures. And this failure rate is also documented really well. And as we can see in this cohort study from Sweden on 30,000 patients, they've seen that young age and high BMI are predictors of early failure after primary ACL. And what you can note out here in men and in women, as soon as the BMI goes from 25 to 30, your incidence for failure is significantly more than if your BMI was normal. Surprisingly, if your BMI is more than 30, that incidence falls down. But I suspect what happens here is, you know, these patients are so large that they're probably not going to run and jump. Whereas the guy who's between 25 to 30 thinks that he's fit, he's going to be trying maybe, you know, uh, fitness regimens that involve him running, jumping, twisting, and that's why he has a high incidence of failure. And we can also see this in patients who are adolescents. So if you have an adolescent with a high BMI, then you can see here that rate goes really, really up. So male adolescents with a BMI between 25 to 30, the failure rate is high, as high as 6.57. So this is a factor that needs to be identified and probably addressed. The second factor is the effect of preoperative knee ligament laxity. So patients who are hyperlax, again, have a significantly higher rate for failure. So you need to identify them. And for these high-risk individuals, you need to think of something else that you're going to do besides your ACL reconstruction if you're going to be preventing them from failing. So very quickly, we've seen the causes of ACL reconstruction failure. These could be technical, biological, traumatic, failure to recognize and address secondary instability, and patient factors. So when you get a patient whose ACL has failed, try and see which one of these factors or which combination of factors has caused this and address these before you do your revision ACL reconstruction. Thank you.